there, my name's Jill Tiny. I'm from Collaboration Global, and this is our podcast, Being Human, Hidden Depths. I'm going to be interviewing some of our members from Collaboration Global, and they're going to be sharing with you their extraordinary lives. Although they would probably believe they're just normal, everyday, average humans, but they are extraordinary. A bit like you and me, we all have our story to tell. We've all been through difficult times, and we've come out the other end having learned an extraordinary amount about ourselves that we can share with others. So I think you'll find lots of things that will resonate with where you've been in your journey as well. I look forward to seeing you on the other side. Hi there and welcome to being Human Hidden Depths, a podcast by Collaboration Global, and my name is Jill Tiny. I am delighted to welcome an old buddy into the room today, uh, one of our new members. Um, I'd love to have nabbed him about five years ago, to be honest with you, um, but he eventually caved in. He said, all right, Jill, I'll, I'll do it then. <laughs> so we had the wonderful Mark Lader with us today, um, known for biz connectors, um, and actually, I think Mark and I were probably separated at birth because our skill sets are very similar. Uh, we know an awful lot of people, we connect an awful lot of people, and he's transformed that into a part of his business. So welcome, Mark. Lovely to have you on the podcast today. Separated at birth. Hey, here we are again. Well, yeah. <laughs> No, thank you for having me on. Let's 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 see where it takes us. You could be my baby brother. <laughs> Long lost families. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and your original um, space, although you're not there now, is Liverpool. Is that where you were born and bred? Yeah, originally, yeah. Uh, I've been that part and then Cheshire till 18, yeah. Right. Cause when you said that you were in Liverpool, I was like, oh, yeah, I, I kind of, I love accents. And I, I knew there was an accent, but I hadn't been able to quite pinpoint it. But the minute you said it, I'm like, oh, that's where it is, obviously. So yeah. not, not a broad Liverpudlian, but um, definitely tints, tints in there as well. Yeah. Um, so you're known as a business strategist, which I love. Um, when you were a kid, was there any signs that this is what you were going to do? What What's your journey to get to where you are today? Did you look back and go, oh, yeah, when I was seven, that's when it happened? Or is it like a surprise to you? I thought I was going to be a vet, and then I realised how hard it was. <laughs> <laughs> That chemistry and physics stuff might be a bit of a problem. It's tricky. Um, a lot of study as well, isn't it? Well, also... You know that if you do, you know that thing where they do what your schoolmates think you're going to be. I don't oh. think my schoolmates would have seen me as that people orientated as a kid, and it was so that's where the vet and animals and stuff. Mm -hmm. And my mother would say to me, "Well, you'll never put them down. You can't be a vet, you because I couldn't. You know, I'm a softy with animals." But <laughs> as I got older, I sort of realised that I, I do like animals, but I like them to be animals, and I like. I like people much more and it the whole sort of I think I think the long-term path was really triggered by discovering I could actually study psychology at you know at uni type thing yeah. because a lot of my friends were lawyers because that was the thing people would you, you should be a lawyer and all that stuff but I couldn't have been a lawyer either because there's too much three-hour dictations on case law and I, I just don't like that type of learning so yeah. I can do what looks to me easy being the barrister of course they've you know learned for years because I can present things but psychology meant that there was no right answer in psychology so it was more about making cases or supporting it a bit like you do in law but through psychological viewpoints and stuff so that that was always my passion and then that got me into I got into sales because you got a car in those days but even then it was about I, I was never the techniques person because it for me it was well humans will do that if you ask them it this way so it was always the behavioural side of it, whether it was in business or in families, and that's what led to the blend of coaching and business, really, which is sort of what I am. So I think it was it was always there, and our family was always that type of family that discussed the why type stuff. We were always interested. You know, my wife next door, she, when she used to come when we were first together, 
you could never sit through a program in my mum and dad's house without it being talked through because we were going to analyze it to death but she'd be like well can we just watch the damn thing you know well that it's, it's just families are just like that so i think i think the headline is the psychology thing triggered a lot of that's that's my area of inquiry I love that. I love that. And I remember those times with my parents as well, not so much from the psychology point of view, but my mum would always sit there through a programme, talking all the way through it, going, wasn't she in that thing, you know, that was the other day, uh, that was in the, the film? Oh, and, yeah. the, and the other yeah. thing, you're like, I don't know, I don't care, just let me watch the damn programme. <laughs> and you end up knowing, well, you could almost play a game and I do it now. Oh, I can't remember. But if you say, you know, the one who was in so and so, well, I can't remember that. And you end up so far away from the original. Yeah, it's just, it's just yeah. a bit. But it keeps the brain active, doesn't it? Well, either that or you Google it for quickness. Yes. Well, that's when we're sitting there with Cody, our son, he just sits there and goes, yeah, it was so and so. It was in Zulu. It was in Zulu. In the- that, yeah, that's just cheating. That's not right. My kids do that as well. It's, it's very annoying. It's interesting that we're all about behavior, though, isn't it? Because what, what makes someone tick? What makes them jump off off that ledge? What makes them reach for the stars? What what makes them a successful business owner? What makes them a failure? There's this because quite often I remember reading an article once about all the the big billionaires out there, and it's like it's not because they're necessarily that much clever. It's not because they had a br- brand new idea. Timing is often everything. Is this coming together of this um, was available, this was brand new, this was an idea, and you put them together, they're in the right time, at the right place, bosh, you know, you've got yourself a billionaire. So sometimes yeah. it's spotting those things, isn't it? That kind of like, what's special about this and what makes it different? And what I love about you is when I see you work with your clients, you, I can feel your brain working. You're like, oh, and then there's that, and then we could, do, and then there's that, and then hang on, well, let's let's take the best ideas because you don't just have one idea. You've got like a dozen going around in your head, and you're kind of filtering through which is the one that's going to work for this person because that might work for that person. We've got right. three ideas; they're all the same. But so, I wonder in this world, my, my brain's going all over the place now. In this world of uh, adults discovering their their superpower aka um, 10 years ago was known as a disorder like ADHD or Asperger's or all sorts of things do you think that the way your brain works is on a higher plane maybe to Joe Bloggs uh, Joe Public out there can you see things that other people don't well I think in my case that particular thing happens to be my thing so I'm good at that Mm -hmm. but if there's one thing i've learned using my wife as an example again that we have similar core values between us but the way we operate is very different so what keeps us together is the core values but we're never competing for the same space so i used to say on a lot of the weekend courses and some of the women used to have a bit of a problem with this line because i would say Ellen never wanted to be number one. And it doesn't mean I'm number one in that either. It meant that I was number one in that particular role at that time. Mm. But it meant really that she was very comfortable in her role. And as as she got a bit older, I think, as well, Mm. just started to realise how almost, I guess, if you look at it from a business point of view, there really are different skills that make it work. So yes, in that, don't they call it ideation? That That's ideation and then synthesizing concepts and all of that fancy stuff. That's probably my, that's probably my superpower. Yeah. But it's no use on its own, Jill, unless there is a system. And when you were talking about the, the billionaires and they've got nothing in common, there's a book that I'm looking up just there now, and I bought it because it was English research. And typically it was often US business stuff because they were so big into that. <clears throat> and I liked it because it was, and I, I actually know some of the people in it and they're high-end people, you know, they're mm-hmm. high-end players. And they basically did their, well, you know, how are they similar? And the answer was that they're not similar. They're, they're not similar, but they found one thing that they all said a form of. Only one. And it was, I realized I had to get organized because if I didn't, I wouldn't be able to achieve my goals. And I think that's the bit that 
if I can come up with 100 ideas an hour and I can show new perspectives, which gets other people going, which is often my job to do, mm. but it then also predicates on the, but guys, without the system to implement that, that could be another person. It could be, it could be any number of things because it's invariably not the you doing it, then that's where this new business paradigm language starts to come in. The way we've been taught to do it is showing clearly 80 plus percent failure over five years, yada, yada, all of that stuff, says what we've been taught is destined to fail. And that's where we've got to make this shift. And given that I'm you know, I sit here with my cockpit, as I call it, of all these different things around me with my timetable here and the outlook here. It's almost like we live in cockpit life now and that yeah. you've got to be able to deal with the amount of information coming at you because it's not going to get less tomorrow. In fact, Howard Berg, who we both know well, will tell you, I can't, I can't do justice to the staff, but it's something like every six months now, more information is created than in the history of the world before oh. that. It, it, it's bizarre. It's, it, it's yeah. bizarre. Yeah. So you've got to have a system, A, to keep you in control and feel comfortable with that because you touched on the mental health, oh my God, I'm on overload, blah, blah, blah. And the quickest way, and as per that research piece, is finding a way where you the person feels comfortable and there is no right way so there's got to be kind of a bit i get my bit is there here's 17 different ways for you to find the one that you like because when people can go oh i can do that one that one's easy it's like finding an exercise program that you like not the one that everybody says you've got to do yeah. and go oh, god you're not going to do it so I, th I think we've I've realized now that in this context, yes, my I'll get you to a different solution. I'll get you moving is a skill based on the thing I do, but on its own and therefore in a broader business context, it's no bloody use to man the beast. You've got to create a structure that maximizes that and work out your key role within the bits that you can do because back to those successful people again they will say they are good at one exceptionally mm -hmm. maybe another thing and they typically know people as well because that but primarily they're not that good at lots of things they found that thing they're good at then they built everything else to support that thing and guess what they whether they're billionaires millionaires whatever they are so it's it's often that get rid of the clutter that the world at the moment is way laid down with clutter so nobody gets any momentum yeah oh that is so true that is so true and i've, I've suffered that myself i know that feeling uh, and when i work with clients one of the things i that I love happening is when they've got a dilemma and they'll come to you with their dilemma and they go, I don't know whether to do this or this. And then when you finish the conversation, maybe two hours later, they've got 20 things on the table and they kind of look at it and go, so if I did that and then I did that, oh, and then I did that. And it's like, then you can see they're excited and it's their choice because you've helped them to kind of unpack what, what is actually there, where they their narrow-minded view had just been like, oh, I've got to do this or this, I don't want to do either of them. And all of a sudden they've got 20 options. And the part of one of the first options might be to do something, but they need to buddy it up with the other two and or other people as well. And, and that for me is the joy of being a business coach. When that penny dropping moment happens and you see them go, oh, so you mean, and I'm like, yeah. Oh, that's my job done. Lovely. Thank you. That's it, moment, isn't it? They've got their aha. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And then you know they're going to damn well do it. Because but, if you say you should really, you should do this, they're like, oh, okay. It's like saying, you know, if you want to lose some weight, you've got to stop eating so much. And everyone goes, okay. So why haven't I, you know, it doesn't, that doesn't, that seems too simple. But there's more to it than that. So once you have to unpack all the options and the possibilities and what suits them as an individual, I think this is the problem in the past is over the millennia, society has lumped people into groups. And that's like, that's what those people do. And that's what those people do. Millennials, baby boomers, they're all the same. No, 
they're not they're not at all they happen to have grown up at the same time roughly doesn't mean to say that they've got the same likes and dislikes and we we clump everyone together and that's one of the things that I love about collaboration global is that we look at human being first so everyone is different hurrah that's that's the joy of life when we have everyone that's being you know coming from different experiences uh, growing up on different continents uh, having different uh, religious views, sexual orientation, whatever it is, and the fabulousness of being different means that we have so much more to give to each other and to share and to uh, share knowledge. So it's, as you say, it's that finding that moment is some people look on it as, uh, I don't know the answer. Right. Well, we're taught that at school, aren't we? Yeah, exactly. We're taught there's only one answer, and the world says yes. there's rarely one answer. But your maths book, you get a tick when mm. you get what the teacher says is the right answer. Two plus two equals four. But as a good friend of mine, Barry Matt is apt to say, and he's an engineer and PhD and very clever dude, does stuff like Howard does, you know, mind mapping and all that kind of stuff. Right. His line is one plus one equals two, mm. but only on the mean. And it's his way. Audi I've watched audiences when he does this. They... They get in for a while and then they start to glaze over because it's clever stuff. And he uses the example of when Ford sprays paint on a bonnet and you know it's all these microns. You talk my tiny, but there's like layers and layers of this. Mm. Well, apparently, if you put one micron thick of this new paint over the whatever, and then they put all these probes to measure it, they're all different. But when you put them all together, it's one. So hence. One plus one equals two, but only on the mean. And it's his way of saying we're taught absolutes when the world we live in is not that. Uh, gravity's an absolute. Jump out the window, it will work every time. Yeah. But it doesn't apply to what you say to one child works with the next. It's much more shades of grey. And mm -hmm. coming to terms with those finer points of the human experience, behaviour again, that that's the bit that we weren't we certainly weren't educated to do that i think nowadays people are cottoning on to all these so-called gurus out there you know if you want to earn six figures every month and you want to do this and this and then you follow my program bang 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 and we guarantee there's going to be is it though <laughs> Does it, we, yeah i'm sure it's going to work for some people and it's like like the diet industry isn't it again i go back to that you know some things will work for some people and and you look up and you go wow that's fantastic i want to get what they have but it's not necessarily going to work for you and until you do some exploratory work on yourself and understand who the hell you are and what makes you tick you're never going to be able to make wise choices around what your business needs as an example which is why we need people like you to kind of unwrap it all and go well, you, this know, is what we have here. you know the line about the was the was no quote overweight people until there was a diet industry yeah because if you go back and it, they aimed at it recently given birth women mm -hmm. so who, you know who are going to have filled out a bit during being pregnant yep. so they're an easy target and they were getting messages called well i want to be back like my girlfriends again and how do i get my, my pre but all that stuff so that was their target and then teenage girls that are always got something in terms of what social pressures. But it just, if you look at that, it started late 50s and then really got going in the sort of swinging 60s. But my sister was drinking PLJ lime. Apparently, you just drank that and pounds fell off. And you go, well, we were being convinced that there was a problem. And then we were being sold the solutions. And whether it's that guru type phenomena that you're talking about, mm. we've convinced that there's a problem and that problem does not exist because the problem we've and we've mentioned it before the call everybody's looking for the skill that they need rather than the structure of the business that that's what we call the new business paradigm shift in that kind of fancy language type stuff because we're looking for that i've got to get good at linkedin i've got to get no you haven't you've got to get stay good at the thing you most love about your business mm -hmm. then 
got to build a system that frees you up to occupy that space. That business has got an 80 plus percent chance of succeeding where the one we've been taught has got a 20 plus percent chance and over 10 years, about a 4% chance. So there's something wrong, Jill, and we, it's, the problem isn't skill, it's structure. That's, that's fascinating. And you know, I know you've said this to me before, but a lot of people out there will be hearing that for the first time going, huh, what, hang on. Um, and it, it makes such sense to me. And I well, wish you'd told me about it 15 years ago, to be fair, uh, because I have been one of these people that go, oh, bright, shiny object. Let me go and have a look at that. What does that do? And, and that's mm. going to save me hours of time. But I've got to spend about 500 hours working out how to use the damn bit of software before yeah. I can save a minute anywhere. Um, and I do remember um, one of the uh, people who used to be in our community, Kay Westrap, she's um, off to doing brighter things at the moment. But she used to say to me, Jill, it's below your pay grade. Leave it alone. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So it was because we felt that there's so much coming at you that you you have to get on top of it in order to be an early adopter, to make the use of it, to not miss out. Fear of missing out was a big one. I mean, um, Clubhouse, how many people threw themselves at Clubhouse when it came out? It was a flash in the pan. You know, it's, it's knowing which are the ones that you need to do. I love Richard Woods. Um, have you come across Richard Woods? I think he, you do know that name, yeah. He was on The Apprentice and he's he's been around um, doing lots of various businesses, but he's got a great philosophy now. Uh, he talks about clarity and he says that it's the focus of one. Have one product on one platform, one event, you know, and just that's that, keep it simple. Uh, and that's how he calls it, I think it's the million dollar sprint. Um, and he sort of tell, tells you, tells you the system. He sells you a system, you do this, in your industry, in what you're doing, and this will get you to where you need to go, providing you're filling in the gaps in, in the right way. So, you know, and it's a very simple idea, but obviously he coaches people to kind of expand it. And it is this not getting overwhelmed with what you should be doing. <laughs> and, you know, what is there should about it really? Um, but it's what you can do for yourself. Now, can you explain to me the relationship between the skill that you have and the system that you need to put around it? If some people are coming at this from scratch and haven't thought about this before. Um, there's a book, isn't there, that was kind of my book of the year a few years ago, the Who Not How book, which was the um, like coach guy. Um, is it? See, there you go. The who not the Dan Sullivan one for the strategic coach I think isn't he? Okay, yes. It's a it, it, it personally I think it's a, a very average book, but the beauty of very average books that only make one point is it's very memorable, <clears throat> and the, frankly the title is better than the book personally, but it's done its job because it's getting people to realise and. You know, I would think a few people listening to you and I talk now grew up with parents that did say to us, it's not what you know, but who you know. And yeah. that's kind of, that's what the book's saying. So it's not new. So that commonality of people who've got good networks in terms of they're able to, I know a man or woman who can type mentality, that's probably, and that where the biz connecting thing started to come from, not from any great plan, it came originally from the vast majority of business owners aren't from any sales and marketing background. So if we had this new role, we could solve that problem. But it was sitting on a wider problem of they were still trying to build the wrong type of business. So the shift to who do I get to help me is often the headline for the shift to that new approach rather than I've got to do it and I've got to find the tool. I've got to spend the 500 hours because mm. it, it's proven not to fail. So we're all wasting our time if we think that thing of software or Anthony, who you know well from, you know, a part of one of the other businesses, mm. he, he loves it when <laughs> some of our American friends that are you know, very evangelical about their product and it's kind of cute, yeah. but, <clears throat> one of them, you know, do this and it'll it'll 10x your business. And, and we know him quite well, and he's given us permission to tell it like it is. 
you get mm, it's not though is it 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 this <laughs> this one thing is not you know he's got a business that's in the millions so this one thing said you're telling me if i do that i'm going to suddenly have a 30 million business not a 3 million business you go that's not it's not it's not the case is it so that's the shiny things piece of us again to get us into that who have you got to find to help you because the thing that will keep most people going if they can spend and invest more time in the bit that they love is the why they wanted to do it in the first place so if they're clear almost on the clarity piece if they're clear on the why and they can get to spend time netty one of our other friends that you know their hair business she gets dragged and is very open so she wouldn't mind me saying this she's a designer at heart and she loves all of that sustainability mm. but i come to the door when i meet her and you go so how much time are you getting to invest on design and she goes five mm, percent oh. and she's got a pile of all these other business oh. things that yeah. leave a fold that's the mm. problem so the shift is the if I can ask myself who, who, who else can I get involved rather than the how it gets people into starting to look at their business what in that what we call that change the structure, not find the skill because it means you're not missing anything. In the skill search, you're always missing something. The next guru that says, well, if you just had this, you'd be fine. That's not accurate. If you move, it's almost like you've got the pieces of a jigsaw and the why says you know what the picture is, but you haven't quite worked out how to get them to fit together yet. That says nothing's missing. It's just to create a case of reordering the parts to make the picture work. So you've got what you need. Now it's a question of put it all together. And the first question seems to be, ask the who not the how question and it gets people on the new path i think i think that's always been the case in business isn't it it's just as you say it's not who you know it's not what you know it's who you know um and that goes back to the guys on the golf course like in the 1950s working out who were the most useful people to them and that was done from a transactional who's going to be valuable to me but i think mm. now the idea is you know if I, I don't know, it's richard branson or somebody said somebody probably like him um I always employ people who are cleverer than I am right. uh, and you employ them for a reason. And so they know their stuff 100% and, and they are really good at that. So whether you're employing someone or whether you are just subcontracting or whether like in collaboration global, you're around people that are quite clever and you just give them a quick call and go, look, you know, you, you know, this stuff, you know, this marketing malarkey or, or, you know, this branding stuff or this website stuff, what would you suggest I do? And, and who, do you know anyone that would be able to support me and help me? It's, it's having those connections where when you're a startup and you want to make it past the first year and you really want to make it past the third year and you want to survive and be thriving by year five at the very least, you've got to have your people around you. Otherwise, you know, you, you have up and down days. It's not like this continual climb forward. I mean, some people, you know, some 20 year old Silicon Valley, yes, they become very successful and they sell their business. And that's not real life. That doesn't, no. you know, that's a flashing. They also that. famously go bust faster than anybody else as well. So it, even that's a, a rose tinted story. Exactly, exactly. So having those people around you through those stages as you're going up and down. And um, was it Seth Godin wrote um, The Dip? You know, how you kind of pushing up and you slide down. You're pushing up and you slide down. But what if you had somebody at the top of that mountain that you were climbing? the Put their hand down and say come and come and join me up here this is a, a different view um, makes it so much easier but i love the idea of we want to be practical and do the doing to get secure and feel safe and that's the systems in place isn't it because you can see the whole map then you can see the whole jigsaw you've got the picture for your jigsaw and you know that that's bit's missing so i've got to go and find that bit and that's part of your job as well as doing your doing for your genius it's a good one for little thing. People latch on to little story-based things, don't they? And in this context, the jigsaw one works for people because we've all played jigsaw. We've all done jigsaws. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think it's a scientific study, but the principle seems to carry that, you know, if you're doing a jigsaw and you're not allowed to see the picture on the box, mm. it takes 10 times longer. <laughs> I cannot, not surprised. 
and it, and it, it's a good story for us, isn't it? Because it, it in this sense, it, it kind of encouraged people that are listening to us talk potentially to go, if you don't know what you're trying to build, then you're just going to play around with the pieces or you're going to be susceptible to the next shiny thing, as you call it. So you're going to spend all your time doing that. Whereas job number one is to get the picture clear because even in the, the Biz Connectors book was the thing about, I want to get rid of the term startup because startup already seeds failure to most businesses. Because when are you not a startup because you wouldn't enter a race to start to be a startup you'd enter a race number one typically to finish it number two you might set a goal like a personal best if you wanted the top honchos you might be there to beat so and so because you'll win if you do that so you'd have a clear measurable outcome but if i ask most people and i do a lot of that structural stuff with people mm. well, well where are you in the business and if we change the term startup to design phase, where people know that they are having to design this, we design bridges. We don't just turn up on the side of a river and go, let's build a bridge. There's quite a bit of work that goes on before we try and build that bridge. But we think we can just, I've got this idea, I've got an overdraft facility, I'm pretty good at this, I think I'll be a hairdresser, I'd do it because I'm better at dyeing people's hair pink. That is not statistically going to sustain. And mm -hmm. it's almost if you wanted a, a metric to measure that, to make a, to again, get people to think about it, if most businesses, the day that they think they're going to open, add six months, add six months and really get that picture clear, really get who's doing the job. You know, my bet, I, I'm not really into little tips that I, I, I've got so many over the years, I just can't remember them, but I quite like the one recently that was um, if, if you're, if you're kind of running the business, so you're sort of the CEO, but most founders aren't really like CEOs. So that's a problem in itself. But leaving that aside, he said, you've got to meet with your COO. It's all American term, this, isn't it? Mm. Being an operating guy, you've got to meet with. And it's almost like at the end of the month, we'll have a chat with you in relation to operations. And it, it sounds ridiculous, but it, at least it gets you to stop and think mm. about can somebody else do those jobs? How would it work if they did? And it's that process that starts to look at the, the it's the old Apollo 13 line, isn't it? You know, in the movie when that's the one that, it's Apollo 13 is relevant, isn't it? It's the one that they got everybody back safely, but yeah. it didn't get to wherever it was meant to. So it was a successful failure. Yeah. And it became our line for saying, because the, Tom Hanks is, plays the commander guy, and but the real commander, they interviewed him and they said, well, the problem was two years before I was appointed as the commander, the fault that I had to do to get us all back safely was already hardwired into the craft. If we don't change the way we are thinking about setting up businesses, if you don't solve that hardwired in problem, you will spend your life your business life solving that problem and most business owners don't the businesses don't call, close because they go you know bankrupt or chapter 11 in american terms they they get closed because the business owner says i'm just too tired i can't i can't keep doing it and we would argue it's because they're perpetually fighting that hardwired in problem and if they go back and solve that Mm. I can switch the metaphors or my analogies to the Excalibur moment, the, what's really called Calibur in the third, by the way. It becomes effortless when you're lined up to it. And it's that perpetual, how many leads have I got today? How many, da, 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 that, that is not business. That is, we're making a dying, not a living. Oh, wow, what a good quote. We're making a dying, not a living. Not, and it's not nice for people that, and then we go, oh, we're stressed, and we go, we open with people. Oh, give me your first five stresses. What, what are the, what are the things that are bothering you? You know, what's the first thing you wake up and think about in the morning? Blah blah blah. And if you can get 
as little as a different insight to those things most people look they start like this <laughs> the end of that as you were talking about before they've got a form of a maybe not an aha but at least they feel right okay because they've got to have days like that they've got to have that at the moment we're just making the business owner base exhausted yeah. exhausted and um, as in my view, the SMEs of this country, and in fact the world, are responsible for getting most of the countries back on track in their economy. And if we are exhausted and we are not able to push past these noises that are around us, if we're not able to see the clarity and see all of those things that you've just said, you know, getting the picture clear, being in the design phase, being able to... Um, who not how understanding the people that you have around you i mean all these things i've written down here um and the fact that we've been taught uh what we've been taught has been destined to fail i mean so many things are against us mm. it's like once you kind of take the the shades off and see things for what they are um and understand that there is a different way of doing it and putting things into place so that you've got the the track record and it's like for me um when I first started in business, we we kind of played a game. We didn't want to go for funding. We didn't want to have an overdraft. We used this teeny bit of our savings to get the uh, ball rolling. And and it was like, do what's free and then do some more of what works. So right. try stuff out. And then when you realize what works, what's fun, what's enjoyable, the people that you can trust, the people that you can utilize, and then go on to the next step and just enjoy the journey, enjoy the whole process. The minute it's like, I should do this, I ought to be doing that, other people are doing this, I need to be getting onto that bandwagon, I need to go on this course, I need to go on that other course because that first course wasn't really as good as they said it was going to be. I'm exhausted just thinking about it, you know, it's really hard. And, and where's the joy in that? And talk about work life balance. It's non-existent when you're under that kind of pressure all day long. If you're doing it wrong, why are you doing that? You shouldn't be doing that. Pay me some money and do it this way. It shouldn't be that difficult. Well, that's the point, isn't it? It, it, it? Our start point is, if it is difficult, something's wrong. So you address that. That's that, Those stresses are going to cost energy or fights with partners when you get home with everything's falling against you so unless you deal with those stressors you're going to stay in that that's apollo you're back in apollo 13 again you're going to stay in that craft for the life until you go enough now i'm going to do it differently on that basis and that that that's the perpetual struggle but at the same token once we're aware of it the old definition of, you know, if you keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result, it's mm. not a cliche for anything other than it works. <laughs> it, it, it's true. You go, I'm going to keep doing this or, you know, unless we are prepared to go, there has to be a different way. And the very simple way I'm suggesting is if we focus on structure, not skill, you will quickly get different results. The most, the most successful people you'll meet, they will not claim to be, other than their one or two things that they had, they're just good at for whatever reason, they will then talk systems and getting organized and all these things of the difference between, well, I got to 100,000, then what do I do? Well, they know their... They know the picture. They know how to get people involved. And it's that piece. And the more and more we can get people, like Nettie is a great example, designers need to design, not become bankers, not become LinkedIn posters, not become great salespeople. The problem in the world today now that what presents sitting on top of all of this is, if you've got 80% of business owners that aren't from a sales and marketing background, and then they all trot off to their networking meetings. They've got no clue about what networking really is. And nobody's taught them how to. By preference, they don't want to be there. When people like me say, what's the business model attached to this? Why, why do you do this in your business? Oh, my word. You'll get an awful lot of what? what, what sorry now. So, so, sorry. You, get, <laughs> you pay, you know, 
BNI or whoever, you pay to do it. And then you pay £16 for a breakfast you don't want. I don't want to be there at 7.30 in the morning. Some people apparently do, but that's not my time. Mm. But you're just doing something and investing time. And if I get people to work out the actual investment in that, and then the return, because there is a return often. The return is often the who, not how. They've got a better network of people who will help them, that's but they're not a better network of prospects. And that's because they've never, A, been trained, and B, they don't want to do that. And the moment they hit that, if I don't want to do that, why am I doing it? They've got a shift to, so who should be doing it if it's got a role in my business? Mm. Mm. And quite often it hasn't got a role in their business. And if they're in, in that environment, whether it's BNI or any other uh, networking organisation, and they don't realise that it's the connections to the people they're making, not to sell to, but to connect to for all of those roles that are required so they can help them in some way to get the right person on board or to help them or to be, you know, um, contracted out to whatever it is. But it's that community, that connection that's the value of going networking now if your networking is all about just getting numbers and just getting you know email addresses you know you you can still pay for flipping email uh, lists can't you why do you need to get to know them but if you're yeah. going to get to know people and spend time with them and understand who they are and actually build a relationship that's the value of all of those organizations but not many people as you say most of them don't want to be there so why would they want to have a relationship with somebody it's like oh I really don't I want to get this over and done with once I've done it I can tick that box and I can go off and do something what that I enjoy absolutely but that again shiny objects or when we say to people well if you you know if you don't like networking and you, and you haven't got a valid business case for why you do it why do you do it you know what the biggest answer is I've got to do something oh Oh, that's sad, that, isn't it? That's the wrong person. It's like, you know, brain, brain surgeons don't go to networking meetings. They might with other brain surgeons. <laughs> they don't offer you special deals on brain operations either. No, thank goodness. The moment you hear these, well, we'll sell you 14 of them. You, go, you only need one, but we'll sell you 14 of them for a quarter of the price. For me, you're in the wrong room. You're already in the wrong room and you're not a negotiator either. So if you're putting all of these things together that are not pieces for your jigsaw, then at some point when that old, you know, when we point and there's three pointing back at us, <laughs> we've got to realise that we are the problem on that. And until we get that shift to structure, business design. How is my business designed to get certain results? Until we cross that, we're going to fight Apollo 13 phenomena. I think there's another step before that uh, that would create the worst case scenario for Apollo 13 if it crashes and burns. Right. Uh, and that's what happens when you crash and burn is if you don't have the right mindset. So if that person that you spoke to um, about networking felt that they had to be there and they had to do it. What else would I do if I didn't do that? They're coming from a mindset of fear. I, I have to do this because if I don't, then I'm not going to get any clients. And if I don't get any clients, then, then I'm not going to have any money. If I don't have any money, and it's woo, 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 woo. So all this big tumultuous, like, you know, tumbleweed just growing bigger and bigger as it carries on. And they've stopped understanding, as you say, the purpose of their business. And the fact that they probably don't have to go networking, there are other ways to connect and talk to the sort of client that they would be able to help. That, that people who aren't from a sales and marketing background are happy to do. Because if we use an industry that we both know, the coaching industry, and you know, I was first wearing the, the title coach in. 1985 so I, i've been around this before it was an anything it when you were four i think that's amazing I mean, Go on. 85, yeah when i was four <laughs> but you know joking aside that industry today and I, I won't say any names it's not fair of the, of the training companies but of some of the biggest training coach training companies that you and i could name mm -hmm. i i've got clients that have been trained by them and they just train them as coaches and they, they're very careful on, well, we're not going to teach you how to be a coach. You go, well, 
But if they don't know how to run a business, unless they're going to go into somebody else's business as a coach, and the people I'm talking to, they're trying to do it themselves. Mm. And when I asked the, the chap I'm thinking of, uh, happens to be a Bulgarian, and he went to their, you know, their latest sort of thing of what they teach new coaches to do. And you know what it is? They teach them to set up strategic alliances. You go, mm, do you know what a strategic alliance is? And the fundamental of the use of the term, because it's a, it's a bit of a misnomer, but it means, it basically means go to other people with lists and they'll promote you. But if you're a new coach, you've got no track record to offer that person. So what? And there's 3.2 million starving coaches on LinkedIn alone that are yeah. somewhere making that offer. So if you've got no experience in strategic alliances, you don't really know what the term is, you've got nothing to offer the person. N nothing. I'm a new coach from XYZ Company. Yeah, I've spoken to 27 of them this week. How will you be able to stand out? And the answer, more than at any time I've been involved in coaching, is really simple. And it is the Acres of Diamonds story that you're standing on diamonds if you know to recognize them. That BNI scenario or any of the networking meetings, it, particularly in the UK base, I'll make a challenge to the UK listeners. If you're not going to that group, and setting up individual one-to-one -one calls yeah. to show them what you do. I'll even send them the prop to use if they want to. And you can do this with any business because in the coaching scenario, if I do a little 20 minute coaching thing, I get them to score things and which are their priorities. And then we do it in a coaching session. Mm. The objective is not to sell them coaching. It's to get them to walk away from that meeting going, Oh, I can see why my cousin might benefit from that. It doesn't mean he'll do anything about it because if I had a pound for the people who said to me, I gave them the words to say and I get, they won't do any of that. But if you invest the time with what are message carriers, imagine those, you know, those sandwich board people with the boards, <laughs> your network members are, like, I defy any person who's part of a networking group, even if it's online, if it's got to be that way, if geographically it's spread out. If you do that one exercise, show people what you do let them engage in even if you're a painter and decorator we only use this type of paint because all of those stuff that mm. none of this turns you into a super duper salesperson or a super duper j abraham marketer it just means you make proper connections with people who understand what you do and now when something pops up they can be a message carrier do that for two months and I'll, I will happily get you ring me and tell me it didn't work because they'll have about 70 odd people mm. all quietly. Oh, Jill mentioned that or so ooh, just if that one thing in the same time, you could have been trying this latest piece of software going on this fancy big. If you yeah. start back in your own square mile, your uh, richest mile in the world, or used to be, the Saudis might have something to say about it now, but used to be <laughs> a square mile, didn't it? If yeah. you're focused there with things like referral partnerships, which non-sales people can easily set up, you'll transform about 95% of the businesses that are typically listening today. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree. hundred percent agree. It's that simple. And that's partly what we do at Collaboration Global. We, everyone's got an opportunity to show off their best stuff. Right. Um, and then everyone's got the opportunity to access it and, and find out, oh, wow, they're good. Oh, that's really amazing. I mean, we've got a, a currently um, a 10 minute teach. There's a video that gets dropped every Tuesday morning. Yeah. And one of our members is doing it. Uh, and I'll give her a shout out. Liz Scully, known as the evil coach. She's very naughty. Know the evil coach, very yeah. funny. And, uh, and she's doing this amazing 10 minute teach. So there's five sessions because um, five weeks in the month. So every Tuesday, this video gets there. And it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. You, She's you know, hit, hit it out of the ballpark. And everyone in our community could benefit from that. It's just whether they go and find it. And a lot of them have been going to find it. So all of a sudden, she's levitated up in our community because of the fact that she spent time to do something. And it wasn't a, a half 
uh, Cox version, it was really professional and really she took care and she worked really hard on it. And I mean, that, that could be repurposed a gazillion times anyway. But the fact is, she's demonstrating to everybody, this is my, my, my was it, uh, was it, how do they say, this is my stuff, this is my um, secret sauce, this is my genius. Mm. Uh, and what she's passionate about and you can tell she's passionate about it so 100 percent, yeah having those one-to-ones and demonstrating that ability and I also think this I spoke to somebody this morning actually who says oh I'm no good at sales I said you do realize sales don't exist sales is just a conversation helping someone solve a problem you don't have to go down the old route like 20 years ago you know persuading somebody you know forcefully persuading somebody that they should need your product they should buy your your gizmo they should get your widget because they desperately need it it's like no it's, it's about oh that's a problem we do this and we do this and it might work for you and it's just helping them to understand that there are choices that they can make and empowering them to make a choice that might be part of who you are and what you do and I think nowadays, especially since the pandemic, people are aware that they're choosing to spend their, their golden pound in, with local people, with people that they know, with people that they trust. With people if they, they can, know. they would prefer to, if, if yeah. they can find it, yeah. Not always, though. It's so true. I love what you're saying, um, Mark. It's, it's, it's kind of common sense that ain't that common. <laughs> yeah. well, you know common sense isn't common practice no no and I, I i talk about this a lot um that the paradigm that we are moving away from is the fear scarcity and competition where people uh sell using that they market using that and i think nowadays it's much more uh along the lines of sort of love and connection and a space for abundance so people kind of are sharing what they love to do um, they are connecting with people and it's not just a numbers game it's a true connection and a conversation and it's an abundant mindset whereby they don't see the need for competition anymore it's like well I'll scratch your back and you scratch mine let's help each other because there's enough to go around the abundant no. feeling again no. um, so if you're a new business or even if you're sort of up to five years uh, in business and you're finding it stressful and you're wondering if you're Apollo 13 and you haven't sorted out your widget um, or even if you might implode because it's just too much, um, it might be worthwhile having a conversation uh, with Mr. Lader here uh, and see if he can find out what that little <laughs> stoppage is. What what the and you don't. It's really hard to see it yourself when you're in the middle of it. You can't see what the problem is. And I've been told many years ago, you know, you're you're your own worst problem, Joe. You're, you're in the way. So get yeah. out of your own way, um, and then you can start seeing where you can go. It's like, oh, okay, interesting. And then you kind of think, what do I love? What's my genius? How can I just keep doing that? And how do I pass it on to other people? And bit by bit by bit, it's not overnight, but bit by bit by bit, you delegate the stuff that you're not that great at um, and you stop dealing with the stuff that you're not good at. So for me, that's IT. So I make sure I give that to the wonderful IT team. Um, and so every time I get stressed, I just bring them up. It's gone wrong again. This little man comes on my screen and sorts it all out. And it's done. And I don't bother. And that was money well spent, for sure. <laughs> well, Galmies, which is get a little man in. It's the bit like when you need your curtains redoing. Famously, when we were still down in Bedford, and there was this job of putting these curtains up. And it would take me, you know, five hours with a lot of swearing and Helen having to listen to it all, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Probably stabbing myself several times or 30 pounds to a guy that could do it in about 40 minutes he used to bring his own vacuum and vacuum up after himself and you kind of wonder you go, why did i put myself through all that agony of should i do it and well 30 quid's this and you go but 30 quid the local economy benefits i saved the five hey. hours ellen hasn't got to listen to me swearing we we often do this you know we just sort of get stuck on it but we are of that generation where our parents will always make do amend so you if yes. you could do it yourself or try at least try and do it yourself you roll your sleeves up you have a go well, now we're of an age where we know what we can do and what we can't do. So my husband was like, yeah, that gutter's blocked. I think I'm going to sort that out. I'm going to get the ladder out. I'm going to get... I said, no, you're not. You're not... I said, what happened the last time you got up a ladder? You fell off. 
how long does it take me. your leg to heal? I said, I'm not going through that again. Thank you. We're going to help the local economy. This is what we're phrasing it as now. The local economy. We're going to help the local economy. We're going to get a little man who's used to getting up a ladder, who's insured to get up a ladder, and he's going to clear out our gutters for us. And you, you, know that, you know that story, don't you? From it was it was just one of those stories that caught on. It's in one of my ebooks thing, and it, it's become uh, it may be the title of a book that I'll write. 10 men built a wall and it comes from being again ellen's family in in australia and they're you know they're all immigrant background irish greek they're all aussies are all, all mixed all sort of thing terrific and you know i'm the blowing as it were they're all the irish together and all the greeks together and the i the, the the father a real sort of interesting little guy and he, he says to me see that wall over there as he's pointing out the front window and you go i built that with 10 neighbors and it was an opening of a story of the amount of jobs him and a group of the guy and the women did other jobs as well but it was mainly structural things and and the more he, he was telling me about it a because you know when you're at people's houses on a sunday you've got nothing better to talk about but he was really telling me about the pride of like a lot of immigrant areas when they first move in they've run down they're not fancy areas mm. and so that wall 10 men built that wall a lot faster than one could. Let's say 10 times for the maths. Yeah. But then next week they repaired somebody's roof. Next week they, and they never exchanged money out of it. They all kind of just pitched in. And if you couldn't be there, if you were taking the kids to football, they just, it was never yeah. formal. But over a period of time, thousands of little jobs got done. And you you got your turn and they worked it out, you know, like communities yeah. do. It's now one of the most sought after suburbs in Sydney. Wow. It's just, and it's this principle of our, you know, go and find 10 local other businesses yeah. that don't, you know, that may speak to the same customers, but they don't sell the same thing. These are easy things to do that, anybody not only can they can do they quite like doing them they actually quite like once they realize they haven't got to be a super salesperson or definitely a negotiator but they can just get local people together to start well i can do that bit if you you know quid pro quo something for something these are old things now that the world is realizing we need some of that old age wisdom again we need to get back to some of that principles of support each other and i think that's a great place to draw it to a close because ultimately what you're saying is we need to get collaborating a bit more we do help, helping each other that's the bottom line i love it thank you so much mark it's been a Pleasure. joy um i love this um what we've been taught has been destined to fail um and you taught us about new book who who not how but we don't need to buy that because we know the gist of that book now yeah. <laughs> well, and they can, people can go and get a quick summary on youtube it, it's a one theme book i love it it, can help you. it couldn't be yeah. clear yeah i love that i generally I, i've read a lot of business books and quite often they're this big and i say yeah. have you read this one and people go no i said well don't bother i'll give you the, i'll give you the short answer <laughs> Well, we also know a man called Howard Berg that can summarise anything pretty quickly. So, you know, you don't yeah. need to do that. unless you want all the stories, you can get the summary. Well, you'll be able to hear, if you're a regular to our podcast, you'll be able to hear Howard very soon. Hopefully, we're going to nail a date with that young man uh, to get him on the podcast as well. Mark, if somebody's been intrigued by listening to this podcast and think, oh, he sounds like a really interesting man. I wonder if he'd help me with my business or mm -hmm. even just want to have a one to one with you. What's the easiest way to get in hold of you? Well, probably for me directly is just go to LinkedIn and it's LinkedIn and it's Qualywood. So take the H out of Hollywood and make it a Q, Qualywood, and you'll get to me straight to that. And it's it's quite a you know a well used site type thing. So Mark Lader, but it's under Qualywood. LinkedIn Qualywood and they'll get to me. He's always got to be awkward, isn't he? Honestly. <laughs> if you if you or if you search Mark Lader, L A Y D E R, and it's Mark with a K, that will get you there as well. But yeah, LinkedIn is the LinkedIn. place to be. Um <laughs> Also, you might draw, uh, bump into Mark if you come to one of our collo Collaboration Global sessions. They're always on the last Tuesday of the month, 3 till 5 um, UK time. Um, and you can find that on Eventbrite if you search for Collaboration Global, or you can find it on our website, collaborationglobal.org. So thank you so much for joining us today, Mark. I didn't ask you the final question I normally ask people. When you were eight years of age, 
what is one of the happiest memories that you can recall when you were a child? Well, it was just a bit more than, just after eight, I think. I think it was closer to 10 when I got my chopper bike. I don't, I don't think, don't think anything rivals that. <laughs> my I husband don't... would agree with you on that one. He, he had one of those as well. I saw it in the shop before they delivered it. It was all partially wrapped up in the brown wrapping and stuff. And my mother got a Provident card, you know, whatever it was, 30 pounds in those days. You could pay it off over time. I don't think anything rivals that. Yeah. And, and I get that if somebody's had to save up for it or somebody's had to wait for it and it's been something that's very special, I can see how that translates into what you do now because a lot of people that are working in business have gone into their business with these massive hopes and these huge dreams. And if it's not working, you've got the key to help them to kind of, of the last piece of the puzzle, hopefully find them mm. the last piece of the puzzle so they can actually complete their picture. So mm. it's, like, it's worth waiting for and it's worth hanging on and doing that extra bit of work to do what you love in your business. So if you're not spending 80% of the time in the bit that you love. Yeah. Work on the reason for that and everything else follows. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute joy, Mark. I'll see you Pleasure. soon. Take Speak care. to you later.